And the book is called uh, Four Day Morning, <clears throat> which is a Caribbean term. But it doesn't make sense that this is it. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Four days, spelled F O R E D A Y. It means before day, there is morning, dawn, really. So it's about initially the idea was to talk to write about my uh, years in Barbados. I came to this country in 1957, uh, in, you know, so in the middle of Windrush, bang in the middle of it, really. And, uh, and so I spent my, my dawn, my early years in Barbados, and then <clears throat> my uh, remaining school years in Oxford. And so I wanted, to, so it, it's a nice sort of position to be in straddling cultures. And I wanted to write about that because I thought that a lot of people didn't know us really as Caribbean people. Some people thought we were savages that swung from trees, quite literally, and, uh, and that we were illiterate and that we were coming here and taking things from the British. It worked the other way, actually, but never mind. <clears throat> so I wanted to show the human side of being from the Caribbean and then the, the downside and the upside from being in Oxford. I'll, I'll read from uh, the section, uh, which is called A Momentous Year, 1955. And uh, it's a momentous year for the reasons that become apparent as I start to read them. Um, <clears throat> 1955 was a, a year of big occurrences in our lives. It started with an experience that required, required us as individuals, members of a family, and subjects of Brit British imperialism to question issues of belonging and ethnic valuation. Princess Margaret visited the island in, 1950, in February. I was in Barbados then, of course, I was nine years old. So she visited the island in 1957. I was greeted with all the pomp and ceremony attendant on the, pre attendant on the presence of a very special guest. Nervous excitement rippled through the island and there was a sense of national pride caught up in the event. Inevitably, a grand uh, public wel um, welcome come spectacle of celebration was planned for her welcome at Garrison Savannah race course. Children from schools across the island, including mine, were bust in for the occasion. Weeks before the arrival of the princess, my primary school prepared for our participation in the, in the event. We were coached to sing a song of welcome. That sound, the first line of which went, oh hail royal Princess Margaret, I won't try to, to sing it, but I could do, was practiced till we could memorize it by heart. There were school rehearsals also for the national anthem, God Save the Queen. On the day of the visit, there's a huge crowd, people of all ages and types, including children in school uniform. There are also dignitaries, what we call great or big people in our Barbadian dialect. The governor general, the prime minister, other politicians and, and especially invited uh, guests were in attendance, but supreme, but supreme amongst them all was the princess. She stood out by her dress and style, <clears throat> spoke from the specially raised platform, then took a circular route of the garrison in a Rolls Royce to greet the people. There was, of course, the regal wave, so I practiced by many royals before and since. I was all awed at seeing a person of her high standing, a woman almost deified by distinction of being white and royal, whatever that meant. It begged the question, could a black woman be a princess? I didn't think so. You would have to be white and British for that. No one really explained what it all meant, except that Princess Margaret was treated as a higher class of human 
from others, a saint on earth? Sadly, these questions were never raised or broached anywhere, not even at home. We simply accepted the status quo, the inevitability of it all. Instead, there was a profound silence over issues of power on those who ruled over us, which of course problematized distinction of class and race. Questions which I took with me into adult adulthood and study in higher education. <clears throat> now I go on to talk about something quite different, Hurricane Jeanette. I said 1957 is 55 actually this happening. Hurricane Jeanette struck on September the 22nd. We were warned beforehand and locals showed many on many on sorry and locals showed unusual urgency in securing their homes. Windows were boarded up, men climbed ladders to batten down shingles on the rooftops or corrugated sheeting. Fencing was strengthened and out outhouses, you know, we had toilets at the back of the garden, held firm with stout timbers. I could see fear, fear in, in people's eyes. One was left in no doubt as to the seriousness of the challenge ahead. Strong winds and rain swept through the island. <clears throat> we stayed indoors and peered at the world through the windows and gaps between the timber, timber planks. Outside the violence of the, the event was unmistakable as trees bowed were broken or uprooted and loose timbers and corrug corrugated iron sheets blown about. During the evening it got worse. My father brought up limbs of wood from the cellar and started pinning the house together. The place looked strangely fragile and vulnerable with the timbers zigzagging through the center of it. Moving from one room to another necessitated stepping over or stooping beneath chunky wooden, wooden beams. The full force of the hurricane struck in the early hours of the morning. I was awakened by the roar of the wind, which whistled as it penetrated every, crest of, every crevice and questioned every gap in the house. My father frantically adjusted the reinforcements, added, adding the odd, an odd nail here and an, an extra piece of timber there. He checked the roof from, out, from inside for signs of weakness in the carpentry, indications of a leak developing or a gap appearing, but everything held firm. Daddy kept wandering around the house, concerned that something might give away at any moment and could lead, lead to a catastrophe. I later appreciated that my father was doing more than protecting his property. He was ensuring the survival of his family. At daylight, the storm was still raging, but we had got through the worst. As the wind abated, it was possible to survey the damage. <clears throat> there, was some, there was some flooding, and almost every fence in our district had been flattened. Coconut, mahogany, and other trees had been blown over or badly damaged, and power lines brought down. Many old wooden homes were simply destroyed with furniture, clothing, and other belongings smashed or strewn about. Later that day, gruesome stories about the hurricane circulated. We heard the, dist the distressing news that 25 people who'd sought shelter in a, near, in a country church had died when the roof fell in on them. There's also the the grisly story of a corrugated sheet decapitating a donkey in someone's garden. We were relieved to be alive and in good shape. I'll move on to a different section. I should say that when my parents came to this country in 1955, in 1955, Three of us, three of my, myself and two of my siblings, one older and one younger, were left with uh, an aunt and uncle. 
and um, that relationship didn't work out very well. They treated us well, but they obviously didn't want my older brother, Gerald, or myself staying in their home. They were childless. They were interested in our younger brother, Levi. And, and you know, he developed a very close relationship with them. They absolutely adored him. But Gerald and I, we moved to a different um, family, a different aunt and uncle, my, my mum's sister, who had married my father's brother. I mean, they were very close. <laughs> um, we got on there extremely well. Our uncle, and, and this is what I'm writing about, that particular family, the second family. Our uncle and aunt's property was effectively a small farm where not only chickens were kept, but a, a couple of cows, pigs, sheep, and rabbits. There was also a donkey, a, a, a donkey and cart. I love the early morning call of the cockerel, the bleating of the black belly sheep, and the grunting of the pigs as they slurp their swill. The heavy scent of cow manure and straw, feeding the animal's foliage, stripped from harvested sweet potatoes, grass and other foodstuff was fun. The cows load their bass notes as they ground, ground their teeth from side to side while eating and the horses we need with excitement before gorging themselves on hay. I love the smell of the cow pen and even the pigsty, the cushion of warm hay on which the pigs slept, emitting a pungent farmyard aroma. I like watching my aunt milk rose the cow and listen as the fine jet speared and froth into the empty pail. Aunt Elise's expert hands drawing down then, really drawing down, then releasing the teats and the steady pulling rhythm. The pens, the potent smell of manure and hay, the call of the animals, were the cornerstones of a unique inner freedom. On reflection, I think every child should have an experience like that. I'll go into another area, still with my aunt and uncle. We pick, you know, we used to go into the, myself, my brother and our cousins. We used to, uh, we, you know, we used to go into, in, into a nearby field, a massive field, uh, where there are all sorts of fruit trees. So I wrote here, we pick cashew nuts and plums, nicked guavas and sucked ackies. Every variety of mango grew in these fields, green, orange, brilliant red, large and small. <clears throat> Despite my previous immersion in the natural environment, Spooners Hill, where there is Spooners Hill, made a big impact on me. It was an experience that filled me with awe at the complexity and fecundity of nature. And it began pretty much, pretty much from the doorstep of my uncle and aunt's property. Gazette's plantation, when the cane was ready for harvesting, was like an impenetrable forest of giant grass, some mature cane, as much as three to five meters in length. As such, it could be a place of of threat and danger at night, while a site of adventure and discovery by day. But all this changed when the cane was cut. Men and women attacked the crop with cutlasses and packed it on, on trucks. When we moved, we got wide sweeping views across the, the strip fields. How different then the landscape with its distant vistas and expose undulations. There's a popular cliche that Belgians run from rain and run to fire. I remember playing in open fields, ignorant of the threat from, th from freshening breeze and gathering cloud of an imminent downpour. Soon the lofty jingle of a million bell chime from drizzle in downward flight before the deluge. Then the race for cover, 
every man jack for himself or herself. The rush to shelter at the onset of a tropical storm was deliciously scary. The biting wetness of drops striking the body now here, now there, in twos and threes. And in moments you were drenched from head to foot. Streams and rivulets, rivulets appeared everywhere. The, the worm drops exploding like tiny bombs in the film of water that soon covered the land. Running speedily at such times was not unlike st stroking a, a reclining torso and becoming better acquainted with its contours, curves, undulations, troughs, the extraordinary sensuality of the land, its rise and fall. 